And now, from the great state of Mississauga in Ontario, Canada, it's the Ted Wallachian Podcast. Brought to you by Tom's Place, for the finest in men's fashion. Tom's Place will suit you. And ETP Canada, providing estate administration with ease. ETP Canada. And now, here's Ted. Thank you, Becky, and welcome once again to our podcast. Thank you very much for joining us. This week, a little bit different. Becky and Paul and I decided we're going to take a little time off. And with that in mind, as opposed to just leaving you with half an hour, 45 minutes of we decided we were going to go way, way back to the beginnings of this podcast. This is actually from um, the second week, episode number two. The date is September 23rd. 2021. Now, again, it was our second program, and we were thrilled, I mean thrilled, to have the legendary Lloyd Robertson. Thanks very much for taking the time. I, I do appreciate it very much. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, Ted. I'm happy to be with you on one of your many new ventures. Thank you. You, you know, I look back when we talk to so many different people about why they chose the careers they did. Many of them can recall one seminal moment that, that cemented their desire to chase that dream. And, and I suppose for you, it was witnessing a parade being broadcast on a local radio station in your hometown at Stratford, Ontario. That's right. Well, before that, Chad, I'd always been interested in listening to the radio with my father, you know, the big, the big shows of the day, uh, Fred Allen, Wayne and Schuster, all coming across the radio speaker. And of course, uh, I got fascinated by that world. So when the opportunity came for me to uh, go with my buddies down to see the parade on Downey Street in Stratford back in 1945, it was only natural that I clustered beneath the platform of the local radio station. And the two announcers, Ken Ellis and Ken Dugan, whose names you see I remember to this day, they were calling the parade of the Perth Regiment marching home from the war, first time. And uh, I was entranced by listening to those voices, uh, hearing them describe the color, the uniforms, the crowds, the kind of day it was, everything. So um, I started getting really involved in the radio after that. I started hanging around the radio station. But eventually, um, the manager threw me out because he said, uh, you know, Lloyd, some of the guys don't like the idea of uh, you hanging in there with them all afternoon on a Sunday, for example. Uh, And it was because, although he didn't tell me this, Uh, They might have wanted to run downstairs to the Windsor Hotel bar for a drink. Uh, The radio station in those days in Stratford was just above the Windsor Hotel bar. (laughs) So it was a great place to uh, listen in on a Saturday night because you could hear the bar as well as the studio. Uh, So I said, okay, thank you very much. I may be back. And sure enough, about three years later, I was. Uh, I got uh, an interview with the program director. And he said... um, Well, I'll tell you what, I'll hire you for afternoons on Saturday because you seem very eager. You really want to break into radio. And I had had some dramatic experience in high school um, in various plays. I had been in public speaking contests. So it seemed a a natural move for me to go into radio. So I started after school on Saturday, operating on the board, uh, rolling records for other announcers. And finally, one Saturday morning, the announcer who uh, was supposed to do a program called Musical Personality Time, followed by the name of Norm Jerry, he um, said, Lloyd, you're going to have to take over for me. I've lost my voice. So I did. And uh, that was the first show I ever did. And they judged, I guess, that, hey, you know, this kid has some promise. Maybe we should keep him around. So I, I did the after school on Saturdays for a year. And then, uh, as luck would have it, two announcers quit just when I was finishing high school. So I was hired on. And uh, that was the beginning of it. I was doing uh, Rise and Shine every morning, 6.30 to 9. I did the noon run, which was uh, called Suggestions of Music, with many more suggestions, the advertisements, than the music, of course. Uh, Alex Smith, the program director who hired me, he was on with the 12.30 News. Then I was back with Uncle Lloyd's Birthday Club at 5 o'clock. And then I did the 6.30 news uh, in the evening. So it was a long day. So you're Uncle Lloyd, but at this time you're, what, 18, 19? 18. <laughs> hey, you're going to be an uncle. <laughs> well, in my family, I have um, 
nieces and nephews who are older than I am, because my father's first wife died when uh, he was pretty young, and he had a second family, and I was the last of the group. Mm-hmm. So uh, we span a wide berth of, of an era. How many radio stations did you work at before you finally landed at the CBC in 1954? Uh, just two, in fact, CJCS Stratford and CJOY Guelph. And then it was Pete Griffin, a name some people may remember, who uh, inhabited the various radio stations uh, in Canada, two in Toronto, I believe. Uh, one was uh, out in Brampton. The other one was Chum. Sure, and Pete was Brampton. working with me in Guelph. And he said, Lloyd, you know, you've got the pipes to do CBC News. And I said, oh, come on. You know, and I wasn't particularly entranced by going on the network. I uh, thought uh, I enjoyed the early, early private radio. But I went down and I took the audition. And um, sure enough, about three months later, I got a letter saying, we are prepared to take you on as a summer replacement announcer at CBE in Windsor. So I was young and single and uh, up for the game. So off to Windsor I went. And once again, I got lucky because one of the announcers there uh, moved to CKEY in Toronto, which was the big Jack Kent Cook powerhouse of the day in the 50s. And uh, I was hired full time by the CBC. And uh, that was July. No, I'm sorry, that was September of 1954. I was hired in July for the summer relief period. And then September, I was hired full time. So that was the beginning of it. And on to Winnipeg, then on to Ottawa, then on to Toronto. And uh, then in 1976, to CTV. And there we are. But were you, when we started at CBC Television, television, the CBC had only been on, on the air for, what, a couple of years at that point? Oh, yes, yeah. Uh, at that point... So there was I, a lot I, of learning I, going on, for, mm-hmm. not just for well, you, but everybody. About it, well, the interesting thing about it, Ted, is uh, there were no colleges or universities teaching anything about television. There were some journalism schools. Um, there was one in Halifax. There was a radio arts course being taught at Ryerson in Toronto. And Lauren Green had an academy of radio arts for a couple of years in the early 50s. But nobody was doing anything about television. So when I applied to go to Winnipeg in 1955, and I went, actually uh, was hired there and moved in January of 1956, uh, you were thrown into it and you learned it by doing it, which I still believe is the best way to learn something. But, uh, you know, we were all green. We were all having fun. We were all trying out our new toy. And television was just really in the 50s. It was just coming on stream in Canada. Uh, in fact, there were still those occasions like, oh, you know, the Grey Cup, when people would get the NHL playoffs, when people would gather at a house on the street where the family could afford to have a TV set, and uh, we'd all go in and get a run. Uh, it was still that period. And it wasn't until the later 60s, 70s, that television became a household appliance, literally. Mm-hmm. You you did a lot of work when you when you started in in television doing special broadcasting broadcasting special events. Is, is that what led you to the, eventually to the anchor chair? Well, I think so, Ted. Because uh, in those days, again, as I said, if you could stand up and breathe and talk <laughs> uh, reasonably well for a period of time, yeah. uh, they'd hire you. And uh, so so I I was on uh, a lot of royal tours. We had the Queen coming and going from Canada many times during that period. And um, I just happened to find my niche doing that kind of broadcasting, which is related to news. So that kind of led me uh, into the news stream. At the same time, though, and you'll remember this, uh, announcers, general broadcasters on the CBC and on private radio, they did pretty much everything. I mean, I would go from doing a, a concert show to doing the news to doing a jazz show, to then doing a variety program. So, uh, you know, there was, I, I, had a, I had my hand in all things. But I think because some of us who were trained for the 1967 Centennial Celebrations, when we were in that training course, we were specifically called upon to do commentary during Centennial Year, going across the country at various events, broadcasting them, and... Um, 
telling the story of Canada, as it were. And that's where I kind of fell in love with this country. And I was all over the place. I was up up in the north with the Queen in 1970, going right across from Frobisher Bay, as it was then, uh, Iqaluit, as it is now, across to the Yukon, uh, up in the far north, uh, where she stopped for a day. Uh, and um, then all across the country, including, of course, many visits to Ottawa and Montreal uh, during that period. So uh, I got to know the country and as a broadcaster. I think that training in 67 set me up for my future like nothing else could have done. Right. Your time spent as an anchor at CBC was only half a dozen years and you, and you left because the union rules wouldn't allow you to write your own news, nor could you re- report stories. So I, I take it you had really no desire to be a news reader per se. Well, no. Uh, what was happening in that period, Ted, television was changing. Uh, and what we saw in uh, the, during the time of the Kennedy assassination was Walter Cronkite come into his own and he established that term anchor. In fact, the producer of 60 Minutes, uh, he really put the term on record and say that an anchor is someone who puts things in context for people, hands off, takes it back, puts what's happening in perspective, and then moves on. And that's what Walter did, unstintingly, for three days straight. So that's when the whole newscaster mode became something else. and. Uh, and what happened in Canada, of course, is that the, the changes were taking place, too, because the expectation was, you know, you, you'd, you'd walk into a bar, let's say, and uh, you'd be talking to somebody and they'd say, oh, yeah, well, what about that story? What about this story? Saw you on the news last night. But I could not really be a news person at the CBC because of the union restrictions that surrounded that. Now, oddly enough, and this is crazy when you try to tell people this, because it sounds bizarre, but uh, I could do election broadcasts and some other things because they were under the aegis of the current affairs department. But when you were doing the news, that is the national news at 11 o'clock, you could read it, but you couldn't change a word without union approval, without the approval of the editor who was at another union. Now, sometimes you had guys who would say, oh, it's okay, Lloyd. I know uh, that's a tough sentence to read, change it. But then you would have a couple of the militants who would uh, simply say, you're paid to read it, son, just read the words and shut up. Yes. And uh, in 1975, this was the big change year for me, before, one year before I moved, I was called upon to go overseas to uh, do the uh, entry of the first vote on Britain's entry into the European Common Market. The whole newsroom, the militants cut control, and the whole newsroom at the CBC walked out over by doing that amount of reporting. Um, Now, oddly enough, a week later, I went to Moscow to do the hookup for the Apollo Soyuz space program. This is really difficult to understand. I'm sorry. But because I had experience through the current affairs department doing special events and specials for the space show, the space shot in 69, They said, okay, we're going to give him a pass on this one. You can do a report into the news for that. That went on the news, and that was approved. Uh, Then a year later, uh, getting closer to 1976, I was asked to go out to uh, do Habitat Conference, and that meant trying to put some reports into the national news because the, the head of the news at the time was trying to push this idea of the involved anchor. And the whole uh, the newsroom wouldn't run my pieces. So it was getting very ugly. And I liked a lot of those guys that were my friends. And I just felt that, uh, you know, as long as I was there in the announcer category, it wasn't going to work. So along came CTV <laughs> yeah. um, and said, hey, come over here. You can do all these things. It's basically talking to the same audience, the nation. And um, we'll give you a hike in your salary, and here you go. So I went to the CBC, and I said, I've had this offer. Uh, What would you like to do about it? And they waited about, it took them six days to get back to me on on what was essentially a seven-day deadline. And they finally said, um, okay, here's your offer. It's not as good as CTV, 
and uh, we will continue to work on the union jurisdiction problem. Well, uh, it, it, it just turned out that uh, the week that I was going back and forth, I talked to the union, I talked to my friends uh, as much as I could because we were trying to keep it under wraps. And finally, I just made the decision that staying there um, in, in, my, in my category as an announcer simply was not going to work for the future. So I just felt I'd be better off in every way going to CTV. And I did not regret it then. I did not regret it now. And, and nor do we regret your decision either. You, you teamed up with, with Harvey Kirk and, and the, the two of you, uh, albeit you're both you know, terrific journalists, but you couldn't have been more dissimilar as individuals. <laughs> That's true. We had known each other. You know, we'd seen each other at press events because uh, he was he was opening press, some press clubs and I was doing the same thing uh, here and there across the country. And we came to know each other and we genuinely liked one another. Mm-hmm. But it was tough for both of us because, you know, we had our own space at se- separate networks. And it's really hard to make that work. But CTV was very plain uh, with both of us. They said, you know, guys, we're, we're taking this gamble on, on you, you fellows that this is going to work. And uh, they wanted me over there because I think uh, maybe I had a little more experience doing specials than Harvey. And uh, they, they they just felt that, you know, they wanted to soup up the news and they felt this was a good way of doing it. And they let me, uh, you know, do do all the specials there as well. So so it was good for me. I think he had a little trouble with adjustment, but because we were friends, we, we constantly went back to the fact that we were pals. We knew how to make this work. And I worked on that and so did he. And the result was that for seven years, we uh, became the longest running national news team in Canada. Mm-hmm. We both had to, you know, we both had to trim our sails a bit, Ted, because, uh, you know, this is a, a, a business of big egos. I, I don't think I have a big ego. Uh, and Harvey was certainly uh, scaling down his at the time. And, and we just, we decided to make it work in our own, from our own professional direction. I think you once described the differences between your lifestyle and his lifestyle uh, in in a very fascinating way. Do you do you recall you were, you were speaking in London at the time? You, you talked about Harvey's life versus your life. Um, I don't that remember. Harvey was tell, me, married. tell me what I said. <laughs> I think you said something to do with that Harvey lost his license twice and had been married three times, and you'd never had more than a speeding ticket, and you're still married to the same woman. <laughs> And that was accurate. That's true. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, frankly, if you're going to do the newscast at 11 o'clock, as I did for 41 years between 1970 at CBC to 2011 at CTV, yeah. 41 years, you are going to have to have a disciplined life. You know, there's not much room for playing around. <laughs> and I decided that uh, this was the career I wanted. This is what I wanted to do. Indeed, this is what I'd love to do. So I just made a commitment that uh, the career, the professional broadcasting duties came first. Ted Wallachian returns in a moment. You know, June is birthday month at Tom's Place. We celebrate all month long. Tom's 67th birthday is June 7th. Annette's big day is June 9th. And finally, Tom Jr. celebrates on the 13th throw in Father's Day and Canada Day and you've got a month-long party. We know how to celebrate with birthday deals like 100% wool suits from $167. Selected dress and casual pants along with shirts just $67. Sports jackets starting at $167. Plus, many more deals all month long. Don't just be a spectator. Get in on the fun. Join the party and head over to Tom's Place. They're located at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Give yourself a present this June with a birthday deal on men's brand name business attire. Wish Tom happy birthday on Facebook for a chance to win a $670 shopping spree. Tom's Place will suit you. 
Have you been tasked with the role of a state executor or expected maybe in the future you will be? Well, if so, let me make your life a lot simpler by introducing you to my friend Debbie Stanley. Debbie is the founder of ETP Canada. They specialize in estate administration. Their goal simply is to help Canadian executors understand their role and how to deal with the loved one's estate. Let's face it, there's no school for this. But ETP Canada offers services such as executor support, estate accounting, and they have a new online course called Executor Ready. It's an engaging video designed to make estate administration easier and affordable. And those are two comforting thoughts during a stressful time. So call Debbie Stanley at one 866 309-0387, that's one 309 387 or you can get her at info at etpcanada.ca, that's info at etpcanada.ca. Now back to Ted Wallachan. Boyd Robertson is, is my special guest today. You talked earlier about uh, 1967. You, you've covered some of the, the greatest events in the history uh, of this nation. 1967 was, was, was a huge moment for you, and it, it really cemented that passion for Canada, as you said. Absolutely, uh, because I had an opportunity to take a look at the country as a whole, to um, understand the regional differences, to understand that we're a country of many different parts, many different peoples, if you will. And uh, it's a tough job to hold this country together. It was from the beginning, mm-hmm. and it certainly is today. You know, we're... We're now, we're now in, in another election situation, and uh, it looks like this may be a standoff, too, because we don't all see things the same way. But the idea of Canada is what's important. I mean, just think of it. This is one of the few countries in the world, if not the only country in the world, that was home originally to two of the great conquering nations. Britain and France. Mm-hmm. And they were brought together on this northern half of this continent. And we were thrown together and we decided we'd try to live together. And uh, we have been making it work now for 154 years, 155 years, whatever it is. And, uh, you know, it looks as though we'll continue, maybe stumbling along sometimes, but nevertheless continue being together. And that, mm-hmm. that takes. You know, people kid all the time about Canadians being nice. Uh, I, I think that's a bit overdone, frankly. I, I think it's tolerance because we've had to learn to be tolerant mm-hmm. with one another. Otherwise, we wouldn't be together. Let me ask you about some of the events that, that you've covered over the years. Terry Fox's Marathon of Hope. What were your thoughts when you first met him and realized what his, this great challenge that he had taken upon himself? Well, of course, that was one of the great Canadian phenomena, the Terry Fox Marathon of Hope, Ted, because it started off as a kid with um, you know, one leg, basically, uh, taken off the knee, uh, trying to run across Canada to raise money for cancer. It was, you know, in, in a news file, it's a story you cover over one day, maybe two days. Um, he dipped his, his, uh, his uh, artificial leg in the Atlantic, off to Atlanta, and he started out. And I think it was the phenomenon that began to grow as the crowds gathered around him at that time. And uh, by the time he got to Quebec, uh, crowds were very large. By the time he got to Toronto, they were huge. I interviewed him when he was in Toronto. And, you know, he was just a normal kid. He was like your your kid next door. He had some anger in him over what was happening to him. And he really did have a mission. And you could tell that this kid was on a mission to fix this thing, to raise money, to somehow get past the scourge of cancer in our lifetimes. He didn't do it for his lifetime, of course, but he did raise a lot of money for a lot of people. And we, uh, the time he had to finish his run at Thunder Bay, CDV decided that uh, we would have a telephone that night. And uh, on a Sunday night, uh, on the, uh, after the Friday, cancellation of his run he went back to vancouver where he continued his treatment and then of course he died the next spring but this was on a september night and uh, we mounted the telethon not knowing quite what would happen and there 
we really understood the enthusiasm of the Terry Fox Marathon of Hope and what he did, the way he touched Canadians right across this country. Mm -hmm. I mean, Terry was the kid next door. He was everybody's young man. Uh, he was the kind of kid you could embrace and say, we're with you, we're going to help you, we're going to do all we can for you. And that was Canadian generosity at its finest, I think. Uh, the whole Terry Fox episode, which continues, by the way, to this day, because those runs uh, go on across Canada uh, and continue uh, around the world. And this year we did um, another anniversary broadcast, the day of the run. And I talked about him and I talked about beating him. And I can't get past the point that this kid, just a, a really a normal kid from BC, Port Coquitlam, uh, he grew up wanting to be an athlete. Mm -hmm. He couldn't fulfill his dream, but he really wanted to complete his mission to raise as much as he could for cancer. And the fact that people have been inspired by that and carry on that mission to this day, we have made we have made such strides in cancer. And there's no doubt in my mind that Terry Fox is the reason for so much of that in this country, because he raised the banner with that run right across the country. And uh, he did it, you know, so much of it in his own way, because he was tough. He was smart. Uh, he really wanted to push, and people could see that sincerity in him, that commitment in him, and that idea that no matter what adversity you face, you try to get through it, you push through it, and that's what we, that was the symbol that he left for Canadians. How many prime ministers have you interviewed? <laughs> well, my first interview was less to be person. Uh, that was at Expo 67 in Montreal. Mm -hmm. And um, pretty well, everybody after that, uh, Diefenbaker, uh, briefly, and I, I, I met him a couple of times in, in uh, situations where he would be out at an event and uh, I'd get him a couple of comments out of him, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, Trudeau, of course, uh, on through Joe Clark, on through Brian Mulroney, on through Jean Chrétien. Uh, the last interview, uh, the last Prime Minister interview was Stephen Harper. I was due to do Justin Trudeau, but um, just at that time, we were, we were, they were changing over and we were changing over. So Lisa did the interview that year and that was fine. Is, was there one Prime Minister that, that was a favorite of yours? Well, I think the first one always comes to mind, and that was Lester B. Pearson, because he had been in office. Um, just a, two, two terms, both minority governments, and so much was accomplished in his time. I mean, the Canadian flag, the Canadian sure. anthem, big changes during that period in terms of our national identity. And he was the one, uh, and the people around him, really who tackled the Quebec crisis. Uh, and I found him to be absolutely genuine in every respect. He came in with his jacket thrown over his shoulder, and the first thing he said to me was, Lloyd, how's your rotten CBC management? <laughs> and I said, oh, what, sir? Yeah. And it was at a time when Judy LaMarche, his heritage minister, had really made some scathing comments about CBC management during the time of the bizarre seven days crisis, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, really hot Sunday night public affairs show right. that was uh, dragging politicians into the set and uh, putting them out of the spotlight. And um, she thought that the way the CBC handled the killing of that show uh, was pretty abominable. So uh, she called it uh, CBC management rotten. So that was his first line to me. And he sat down and we chatted away and the interview was great. And I found him to be open and genuine, most of all because even though he was by that time a famous international diplomat, he was still genuine and humble. And I, uh, I guess it's because it was my first interview with a prime minister. I remember that one, and I really, really liked him. I loved John Diefenbaker, too. John Diefenbaker uh, was a game, pretty much what you saw. Yeah. I mean, he would shake those big jowls of his, <laughs> and he'd say, they're out to get me, but they won't get me. And indeed, it was a, it was a proud moment of his when, uh, in 1965, the second 
uh, Pearson election, Lester Pearson was trying very hard to get a majority government. It's somewhat similar to today, and he didn't get it. And Deef was out at his railway car in Prince Albert, and when the cameras cut to him, he said, well, there you go. Ha, ha, the liberals. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> am, am I correct in assuming that, that over the years, you were approached on many different uh, occasions by, by various parties to run for politics? Yes, by the conservatives, uh, both on both occasions in my home constituency, which would be Perth, Wellington. Um, by First of all, by the person who had been the MP there for many years, Bill Jarvis, conservative. He wanted me. He approached me in 1984. That would have been the first Mulroney government. And then again, much later, in 20, 2003, for the Liberals, there was a by-election, and uh, they approached me to go into that. But And then again for the Senate, Jean Chrétien. But on every occasion, I thought, you know, I really love what I do. Yeah. I've spent a lot of time trying to make our broadcast, CTV National News, an open portal for all parties so that everybody can come on, state their piece. They'll be questioned. They know that. But uh, they state their piece and we're open to them. And once you establish that kind of reputation, I don't think you you want to go out that way. I didn't want to go out that way. And that's, that's what I had to wrestle with, especially yeah. regarding the Senate. Because the Senate, uh, it would have still meant that I would have had to join the Liberal Party to go in there as a Liberal Christian appointee. And I felt, uh, you know, after, after all this time, trying to be the objective, balanced, fair mm-hmm. anchor for the Canadian people, I don't want to suddenly mark myself for one party or the other. And when I talked to um, Jimmy Patterson, the billionaire out the West Coast a few years after that, he asked me if I'd been approached. I said, yes, I have. And I told him the same story I'm telling you. And he said, well, Lloyd, he says, you know, you are absolutely right. Because once you establish yourself in a certain way with a reputation with the Canadian public, don't do anything to tarnish that. Go out that way. Leave it as it, leave it, as it stood. Good point. Let me get your thoughts on on the current state of uh, of the media and, and news, uh, especially. It it seems to me that television is losing out in so many different areas to to streaming and 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 very specialty channels, and that's more in the entertainment side. CBC, CTV, Global, all the major um, players in the news industry still are the ones that dictate what it is that we see and we hear. On, on our various platforms. It, it all has to come from one central place. Would you agree in, in, in that, that, that the role of national news has not been diminished? I don't think the role of national news has been diminished in the sense that it becomes the last source you trust. Right. Because, you know, they have the professionals who have spent years honing their crafts in those yeah. newsrooms. Uh, some of those people have done nothing else but do journalism from the time they were kids until they're in their 50s, 60s. So these people know how to do it. And it does take judgment. It does take, you know, a professional eye to know how to put something together that is balanced and fair for anybody tuning in. Now, in the age of social media, of course, you've got all kinds of opinions floating up there about everything. Mm-hmm. And they're from the conservative side. They're from People's Party of Canada side. They're NDP. They're further left than the NDP. And, um, you know, these are all taken into account. But that's just noise. Much of it is just noise. It's people giving their individual opinions. But when it comes to distilling the events of the day, putting them in perspective and putting them in context, I don't think anybody does that better than the national newsrooms of this country. And I think it's something we can be very proud of, our record in news, because You know, we, like every other media uh, arm that has been developed in this country, have had to compete with American television. And that includes in news. So we have to make our broadcasts as interesting, uh, as uh, as clever, and as interesting in production terms uh, as the Americans do. But we fill it with our own information. So, and I think we managed to do that because... The Canadian newscasts in this country have much more in the way of viewership, especially the evening newscasts. 
than the American evening newscasts, mm-hmm. or, which are on at 6.30 for the most part. So I think we've done a really commendable job in, in, that, in that area. And it's one thing that Canadians can be proud of, I think. Do you think that the media has done a good job in covering the pandemic? Some people believe that that the media should be constantly reminding people that that COVID, in fact, is is a moving target. It's 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 constantly evolving, which is why the, it, we seem to have made so many mistakes in in masking and washing hands and 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 distancing. And, and things keep changing, and it, and people tend to be confused by that. Well, I think it's the action of the governments, which the media, you know, they were they were covering what the governments were doing, what the what the medical authorities were saying. And they would admit the scientists and the medical people involved in this would say, look, this is evolving. This thing came upon us. We had to learn what it was. We had to learn how important masks were. We had to learn how important vaccinations were. We had to learn there were some vaccines that might be more acceptable than others. So. The news in the country, the news systems within the country, have merely been following what the governments were doing, uh, because you know we couldn't lead the parade on this. Right. What did we, we could ask questions, but sometimes there were no answers. So unless you know your medical authorities uh, are moving forward, there's not much the media can do to cover it. I think this is one of those stories said where there really are no positions to be taken. It's information, and it's getting the latest and best information you can get and get it out there as quickly as you can and on as many platforms as you can, because it's really critical that you, that you uh, cover this story in a way that people understand it and people know how important it is, A, to get the vaccination, that kind of thing. Uh, but also, this is another area where social media does a disservice sometimes because there's a lot of propaganda uh, out on the social media platforms, various ones. And again, those in the regular news systems have to take a look at that and say, okay, what's right here? What is just somebody sounding off? Uh, and, and what's correct? And that's the job, again, of those people who distill the information for the nightly newscasts. That's how it works. And that's how it has to work. Because we can't rely, that we can't just get all of our news from comments and opinions on social media. We've got to have those organizations, I include the newspapers in this too, the newspapers and the, the television networks that have the professional people on board to make those really critical decisions about the information and what is not, not, not holding any information back, but getting out there what it can be. And some days, you know, you'll put out a story and the next day the story changes. That's just the way it is. Because that's the way it has been with this pandemic. If you were approached today by someone who is considering a career in in broadcast journalism, what what would be your thoughts? What would be your suggestions? Well, I would tell them, first of all, that it's not nearly as easy to get into the game as it was when I started. Uh, Maybe as you said when you started to tell them, you're much younger than I am. But uh, (laughs) But I, but I think uh, you know we'd have to be honest with them that it's it's a tough row now, much tougher than it was before, because of the competition, because uh, of what social media has done to the whole industry, almost turning it upside down, and um, you know the the various avenues they can go uh, where they where they might want to, you know, some want to become influencers now. That is, uh, go on social media and push products. Uh, that, that would be my choice, but nevertheless, uh, that's what some of them are, are going in for. So I would encourage anybody who's really passionate about it, especially about news, if you're really passionate about the subjects you want to cover, if you want to cover, cover the country and you want to learn more about the world, then journalism could be for you. Um, it's, but it's not a part-time job. It's a full-time commitment. And uh, some days it's... 20 hours, you know, uh, during election campaigns, you're on duty all the time from the day the puck drops until the last vote is counted. And uh, that's that's just the way it is. So you have to make that kind of commitment, too. And that, you know, a lot of kids now will say, well, that's going to affect my personal life. Well, yes, you're right. But so you have to sort that out. You, you've got to find a life-work balance, which we talk a lot about now. We didn't when I was coming up. 
it was mostly work, work, work. Uh, life came later. You know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Listen, Lloyd, thank you very much. I can't thank you enough. It's been, it's been such a, every time we chat, I, I really, I walk away just feeling like I've learned so much and it's just, it's such an enjoyable moment for me. And, and I thank you for taking the time. It means an awful lot, an awful lot to me. Well, Ted, thank you very much for inviting me on. I'm glad to see that you're still trucking on and still doing things. I mean, that in itself is encouraging to anybody who wants to get into the media because you can say, hey, there are many different avenues. There are many different ways to go, uh, but you need to get established first. And that is harder today than it was at the beginning of my time in media. Yeah, for sure. All the best to you, Lloyd. Thank you very much, my friend. Thank you, Ted. Same to you. Okay, take care. There you go, from September 23rd, 2021, the legendary Lloyd Robertson. That was uh, episode number two um, in the history of this podcast. So, anyway, so we decided to take a little vacation, as I mentioned. Next week, we'll be back with a brand new, fresh program. Thank you all for tuning in. Don't forget, go online and you can fill out your organ and tissue donation card. You could save or at least change a life. Have a great week. The Ted Wallachian Podcast has been brought to you by Tom's Place. For the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices, it's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. And ETP Canada, providing estate administration with ease. The Ted Wallachian Podcast is produced by me, Becky Coles. Technical production by Paul Gadd. Music by Bike Thieves. For more information on this podcast and our sponsors, and to talk to Ted, go to www.tedwallishan.ca.